Hi, uh, I'm Casey Krause. I'm the urban forester for the city of Knoxville. And this is our uh, second presentation that we've done, second or third uh, presentation that we've done through the city of Knoxville Tree Board. Um, we've got Lee Rumble with UT Extension who will be uh, doing his presentation tonight about tree planting. And uh, Craig Walker is also, as you can see, he's our education chair for the city of Knoxville Tree Board. And he helps put together these uh, presentations. Um, if, if there's any specific topic you all would like to see in the future, uh, please put it in our chat box. We would love to get some input from everybody. Um, give us some insights on how we do on these. And uh, this is something we want to do more and more of uh, moving down in the future. So uh, with that, I'm going to present or uh, introduce our presenter tonight. Um, it, it is Lee Rumble. He's an ISA certified arborist and he works for UT Extension. Uh, he's relatively new here to Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, he took over for David Vandergriff, who was our longtime extension agent for UT um, and, and Knox County for, for uh, several years. Um, and Lee uh, has brought a great wealth of knowledge uh, to Knoxville, a lot of energy, um, and uh, definitely has a great insight. It has years of experience um, working in the field of arboriculture and uh, uh, looking forward to hear what he has to say tonight. So Lee, with that, I will turn it over to you. All right, great, Casey. Thank you so much. And Craig as well, uh, thank you for, of course, inviting me to talk. Um, really excited to be here, of course. As Casey mentioned, you know, I do have a rich background in arboriculture that dates back almost two decades now. And I was fortunate to be one that actually kind of fell in love with what I did before I started pursuing my education thereafter. So for me, it worked out perfect. And um, I, I just, I knew I wanted to come somewhere that I could educate people, but also continue to educate myself because that is what arboriculture is. Things are constantly changing. So tonight I'm excited to present to everyone uh, a little bit about how to select plant and establish new trees in the landscape so thank you all for joining us and you know I would start off by saying that we we really are inherently drawn to plants right and certainly those of us that are here on the call tonight I think that is very true you know we're attracted sometimes to their aesthetics or maybe the texture they bring into the landscape or maybe it's just the color the smell the taste or we may even use those plants as a form of therapy but we all have our own reasons but we also like plants because of their shape right we can mold and manipulate plants into what we want them to be but all joking aside, what I mean by shape is actually a tree's natural growth habit. We try not to shape trees anymore. Um, that's an old school technique. And really what we do now is work with what we're given from, from nature. Um, trees, of course, have a wonderful way of really um, complementing a landscape if they're properly spaced and suited for the, for the environment they're going in. So using the right species can really accentuate you know a property and give us a lot of wonderful benefits throughout the year now when we plant a tree it seems like we're just planting a single isolated tree you know in our own yard but we're not we're doing so much more than that we're actually benefiting the urban forest which in turn benefits us as a whole as a community you know, there are multiple lines of research that have shown that urban forests promote a greater social well-being. We're happier around the presence of trees. We also take a greater sense of ownership in those trees. I think if any of us here were to see someone vandalizing the oaks in Market Square, we would probably step up and say something about that. Of course, we know that trees play a lot of ecosystem services. They reduce that heat island effect. They, of course, slow water runoff, attract wildlife. And research has also shown that they even help to reduce crime rates. And of course, we know that they also increase property values as well. So urban trees are really these wonderful, splendid organisms that we can utilize for our own well-being. But 
those benefits only come if we really take in a few important considerations and we ensure their long-term survival. The first is really what is the goal of that long-term planting? What do you want to see in your, in your environment or on your landscape? You know, do you want a large tree, something that's gonna be massive and produce shade? Or are you looking for something smaller that's ornamental and maybe has showy flowers or unique petals or flowers, uh, excuse me, um, leaf patterns? Or do you want a tree that's gonna bring in wildlife? Um, of course, we mentioned texture earlier, you know, some trees promote a great amount of texture that can really almost look architectural in the landscape. Or maybe you're trying to block a view, you know, this is kind of one of those first thoughts that you have to consider as someone that's going to be planting a new tree. Now, we also need to think in terms of what amount of input are you willing to invest in that tree long term? And that may mean in time, or it may mean in terms of money. You know, are you going to go out and irrigate that tree when we have long droughts like we had in 2019? Uh, are you willing to prune the tree? Do you have the skills to prune that tree or are you going to have to hire an arborist to do that? Also, how are you going to handle disease and insect pressures when they come up? As well as debris cleanup. You know, a lot of times people plant trees with really good intentions and then 20 years down the road, they realize, boy, this is a messy tree and that ultimately leads to the tree's removal. Now also it's important to keep in mind, you know, is that area even conducive for a tree? You know, a lot of times we try and plant the wrong tree in the wrong location. So I would encourage you to really take in those space considerations. Look around the site. Are there structures nearby? Are you going to have to prune that tree regularly? What about roadways that the tree could overhang? Power lines nearby? And could fruit or sap become an issue later in life as well? So these are kind of some initial considerations, but it's not just those personal considerations, it's also the site itself. We need to know a little bit about the site where the tree is going. You know, all too often I'm asked, what tree should I plant? And that's hard to answer over a telephone call. Uh, but oftentimes I encourage, you know, looking at all of these considerations and taking them in as a whole before selecting a tree. You know, UT of course offers soil testing um, and that is something that may not be important on every single tree that you plant, but it's always a good starting point. Find out what kind of nutrients may be needed for ornamental trees that you're planting on. What's the pH in the area? Do you have a lot of organic content? What does drainage look like? Have you done a PERT test? Is there enough soil in that area to accommodate that tree once it's mature? And what is the texture of that soil? Are those roots going to really be able to thrive in the environment you're putting them in? Also, microclimates are important to consider, particularly on berms, right? Berms are going to dry out earlier in the summer, or are we in a low-lying area that may hold abundant water? That may help us to determine which species is going to be better. Also bring up nearby plantings because we have to keep in mind trees are phototropic organisms, meaning they chase the sunlight. So if we put a tree next to a neighboring tree, we may get a disfigured brand new planting that we weren't expecting as a result of that tree continually growing to reach out for that sunlight. In addition to this, what type of impermeable surfaces are nearby? Could there be any pollution runoff or salt that's pushed up onto the root system of the tree, as well as reflected sunlight that may come off of a, you know, parking lot or a sidewalk? In addition, what targets are in the area? So tree risk is based off of, you know, ultimately um, how much risk or what targets are in the area. And we ultimately remove trees as a result of high risk targets that could be injured. So if there's people or pedestrians, vehicles, whatever may be in the area, that kind of helps us to determine whether or not a tree is going to be safe to keep. So same is true for power lines and below ground utilities. Uh, again, I bring up structures, you know, what, what would be damaged if this tree were to fall? And these seem like really basic concepts, right? But all too often in the urban environment, we overlook this. I think all of us have seen trees planted too close to buildings. We've seen the improper species selected for a site. 
We've seen trees that just don't belong in small planter beds, you know, placed in, in, in these small tight areas next to foundations in between sidewalks. We also love to landscape in monocultures. So taking that one species and just planting 10, 12, 15 in a row. And finally, a concept I like to call what looks good on paper doesn't always work out so perfect in, in the actual landscape. You know, this is almost an obstructing view of the house, probably not what was wanted. So how do you choose an appropriate tree for your yard? Well, it's going to be a matter of both your own personal preferences as well as some professional recommendations. You know, the formal gardener is probably not going to want the same tree species as the backyard homesteader. One thing I like to encourage people to do is get out, go for a walk, walk around the block, drive, talk with your neighbors, and look for tree species in their yards that are doing really well. You know, if you have a dogwood that's really thriving in a neighboring yard, the chances are yours is probably going to thrive in that same area if you have soils that are very similar, which oftentimes in large urban areas we do. So I would encourage you to do that, but also contact your local county agent. Um, I imagine most of us are here from Knox County this evening. But, you know, I'm fortunate to work across, you know, the entire state with hundreds of other professional extension agents that are all here to help. So reach out to your own county agent if, if you're not here in Knox County. So when we think in terms of when to plant a tree, when is the best time to plant a tree? I wish Zoom were a bit more interactive and I would ask, you know, maybe the group to speak up, but Certainly, I'm going to say 20 years ago, as the Chinese proverb would state. Uh, but in reality, of course, we know we are spring and we are fall planters. Those are our two planting periods. So spring brings with it some advantages, right? Things are starting to grow. People are usually engaged. They're ready to get out. And nurseries are oftentimes full of stock, nursery stock. Now, of course, spring also brings with it cool and wet temperatures many years. But there can be some disadvantages to spring planting. One being is that a lot of the selection that I see in nurseries are really just a very few number of species. Um, and that can be challenging if you're looking for those unique species. Now, another issue I see with spring planting is a lot of the trees that are making it to nurseries early in the spring they may have just recently been dug and transplanted from another area, another state, another part of Tennessee and brought here to Knox County. So we have to keep in mind that they may be undergoing some transplant shock. Now, in addition to this, if we do have dry weather in the spring, we may need some supplemental watering. Now, fall planting brings some other advantages as well. And Really planting in the fall is nice because these plant shoots really aren't, aren't in need of the same amount of uptake and water and nutrients because they are simply preparing for dormancy. Instead, in the fall, we're gonna of course see those photosynthates starting to move towards the roots. We're gonna see those roots continue to grow throughout the fall. And really roots are thought to have grown until about 45 degrees. Now, one disadvantage is nurseries may be low on stock in the fall. Uh, they may even have a lot of the carryover from the spring that they have not sold. So be on the lookout for that. In addition to that, another big disadvantage is if you plant too late, there could be some winter injury. Now that's not generally something that's gonna kill a tree, but it may knock it back severely and even disfigure the tree. Also, if you keep in mind, as we mentioned previously, you know, last year, 2019, we had three months of heavy drought here in Knox County. So use caution when planting in the fall. In general, I love planting in the fall because fall is going to give that plant or that tree time to establish a really solid foundational root system before that upper canopy actually leaves out. Now, what do we consider fall? You know, that's variable by year, but generally September, October, and November are good planting dates. Certainly that, that can shift two weeks either way. 
And when we think in terms of spring, really we're talking Valentine's Day to Memorial Day. So Feb 28th to about May 31st. Now, does that mean you can't plant a tree in the summer? Absolutely not. You can plant a tree in the middle of the summer. Just know that it is gonna be a little bit of additional work on your end, making sure that tree is protected, watered, and ultimately maintained through any dry spells. Now, before we go sticking a tree in the ground, I want to talk a little bit about the urban environment because it's important that we understand that when we're planting a tree. You know, our urban environments are usually highly fragmented. And what I mean by that is simply, you know, the soils in this property, they're going to be vastly different than the neighboring property. And that may even be true directly across the street. So we have fragmented blocks oftentimes of soil in these neighborhoods. Now, in the urban world, we know that we use a limited number of species. If I asked everyone to write down 10 of their species that they know in the chat box, I imagine eight of those would come up very, very regularly. Um, we also see increased temperatures in our urban environments and air and soil pollutants are very common. And ultimately, the urban environment's just one that's greatly influenced by people. And that's generally not what our trees like. Now, if you've ever taken a basic soils class, um, you've probably seen this image before, OAEBC. It's something that you're basically taught very, very early on in soils class, with O being kind of that really nice organic layer followed by the topsoil into this zone of leaching down into our subsoils, back all the way down to the parent material before reaching the bedrock. But, you know, if you've ever stuck a shovel in the ground in East Tennessee, you know that that's just not what our soil profile looks like. Instead, we usually see poorer soil conditions. We see soils that are highly compacted, as we can see here. Um, this is a phenomenon known as glazing, where you kind of see this really sharp contrast, where we, we kind of have some broken crumbles here, but we have a nice glazing, likely as a result as a bucket you know, dragging across that. But in addition to that, we have another issue down here at the bottom where you see water already collecting. And a lot of times in urban environments, as a result of that compaction, you may have a hard pan. In other words, an impervious layer of soil within the upper one to two feet worth of soil. In addition, we see zero organic up here, really. There isn't that nice black, nice high quality topsoil and organic layer. Instead, we have basically just grass, a little bit of root penetration, and then we're right into clay. Now, as a result of this, of course, we oftentimes will see higher soil temperatures when we compare this to, say, a natural forest uh, that may have a really nice high quality organic layer. So it's safe for us to, to conclude that urban soils are just vastly different than forest soils, yet we take the same species out of the forest we bring them into our urban environments and we expect them to thrive. So one thing that I see that is often neglected when we're planting new trees is really kind of assessing what drainage looks like on your site. It's a very easy task, you know, do a PERT test. Um, it may take one or two days total to do just because of the time constraints, but it's certainly worth knowing how well your soils are gonna drain. Now, in general, I like to wait until after it has rained very heavily and all that gravitational water has flowed through. So the soils are what, it, what is known as field capacity. So that is a good time where you can go out and work that soil fairly easily. This is what farmers generally like to plow in. So at that stage, you can dig just a 12 by 12 hole here, something very simple, 12 inch deep, 12 inch wide, and go ahead and roughen the sides of that hole to eliminate glazing. So in that previous slide, I talked about glazing. Glazing can actually happen with just a spade shovel as well, where that edge actually just glazes over. And ultimately that restricts water infiltration and also subsequently root penetration. So scratch those with like a box cutter or just a hammer, something that can score the edges. Now, ultimately, you want to go out and fill that hole completely with water and wait for 24 hours. Come back the next day at the same time. 
At the second time when you show up, go ahead and insert a tape and a piece of bamboo or a ruler, something that gives you an, a, a good reference point. And I want you to fill that hole with 12 inches of water. And ultimately, you're going to measure how long it takes for that to then drain out of that hole. If you come back in less than an hour and all that water is gone, you probably have too much drainage. Now here in East Tennessee, you're unlikely to see that. But if you see it taking more than 24 hours to drain that hole, you probably have a much bigger problem on your hands. So what's ideal? You know, six to 12 hours, all of that water should be gone. So if we're draining two inches of water per hour, it should all be gone in about six hours. So if we're draining, you know, one inch per hour in 12 hours, that 12 inch of water should be gone. So that's kind of our ideal. Now, I'd say do this because this step alone may change your species. If you're outside of this ideal range, you may not even get to select the species that you originally chose for whatever aesthetic reason you may have liked. And in addition to that, this is really one of the greatest challenges that we see with monocultures, especially for me as someone that has to go out and diagnose why one random tree died out of a row of 15. This is very hard for me to know because if you haven't assessed that drainage and we can't talk about how much drainage or how quickly those soils are draining, it can be a challenge for even the best diagnostician. Now real quick, I'll show a quick case study, if you will, against monocultures. So I had a resident here in the county reach out to me and they had ordered five Japanese cedar trees and they had already dug the holes. Uh, they had used a stump grinder to remove some older shrubs and they went ahead and dug the holes out a little larger than what they would have, you know, with a shovel. And they had already planted two trees, one here and one behind me that we can't see. Well, they went ahead and had those holes dug already. And then all of a sudden they got hit with heavy rains and came back the next day and they were like, whoa, what is going on? So two of the holes had drained extremely well. They were gone, you know, the very next day. But this third hole, as you can see, this is a big problem. I, I don't care what species you select, uh, nothing's gonna grow in a soup bowl here. So. We started talking through it. I started asking some questions, you know, about what the site had been like. Had there been any major construction or damages in the area, any changes? And she said, well, you know, they did put in a drainage pipe on the other side of this fence recently when, you know, when they were redoing the, the, uh, the rainfall system. And as a result of that, they had brought in an excavator into here. So they had likely compacted this soil and in essence, just created this hard pan that wouldn't allow that water to flow through the system. All right, so we have talked a little bit about those initial considerations, the soil, what we like, what our long-term goal is, but now we're ready to actually get out to the store. We know what our infiltration rates are. We understand our perk test. And we're ready to buy a plant that's uh, appropriate for that location. So what do we look for? Well, we want healthy nursery stock. Of course, we know nursery stock comes in bald and burlap, container grown and bare root. Those are the three ways we buy our plants. Everyone's probably bought the bald and burlap and we probably all bought a container grown tree. These are less frequent unless you're ordering large quantities, but bare roots can actually be a really great uh, type of nursery stock to plan out in the environment, so long as you have a little bit of time to wait. Now, no matter what type of stock you choose, it's important that you select healthy plants. Um, from the beginning of the life of the plant, it's really important that we maintain that health over the long haul. So obviously we wanna look for stock that is free of obvious injuries, particularly those injuries at the base of the tree or the base of the plant. Uh, those ultimately become not only a hotbed for infection, but they can also lead to instability later in the life of the tree. Of course, no diseases are pests. Now you as an average homeowner, you may or may not know what diseases look like or pests look like. 
but you can take images and you can look and you know you can reach out to county agents you can talk to the growers and you can try and work work through that you know i'm that guy at the at the nursery that's pulling plants out of pots looking at those roots you know um, if you look at roots and they're brown, discolored, and black, you probably have a form of root rot going on. You know, I think I see one healthy root right here by this laser pointer, maybe one other here. So this is a plant that really isn't actively growing. But if you can take one of these little brown roots, and if you can actually pull that root, the, it's almost it will pull off like a sheath, you know that you have a, a pretty clear root rot as a result of abundant moisture buildup in there. Now also be looking at the top of the plant as well. Is there new active growth up there? Uh, that's gonna be important because that tells us whether or not that plant is really growing or if it's just kind of sitting stagnant. Um, be aware of tipped or topped plants. Now this is less frequent when you go to a professional nursery grower than it is maybe say a big box store. A lot of times some people uh, or individuals will actually tip the, the ends of the plant off. And what that does is it gives an appearance that it's a, a larger plant or a larger tree with more active growth. So use caution when you see that. Look for tipped or top plants. In addition to this, we wanna be on the lookout for trunk taper. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more later in this presentation about taper, but taper is simply where that trunk meets the surface of the soil. I want to see a flare on either side of that main stem. So you don't really see that much in any of these images, unfortunately, maybe a little bit here, but ultimately what that tells me is that that plant is too deep in the pot. And that's something we do need to be on the lookout for because keep in mind, some of the nursery growers, you know, they're potting up thousands of trees a day so they're not looking necessarily at every single mistake that could potentially be made. So use caution, dig down a little bit. If the root flares an inch or so below that, that's certainly okay, but make sure when you go to put that tree in the ground, you're aware of that and you go ahead and scrape off that top inch of soil there. Now we also wanna look for good quality graft unions. Um, you know, a lot of our really unique cultivars are grafted. Now this is a graft union. You can kind of see a little kink in the tree. And this is minimal in terms of, you know, the long-term uh, product that'll be produced here by this bald cypress tree. So don't stress a little kink, but certainly if there were, you know, an area that had a large decayed area, or if the kink was really excessive, maybe something more to this effect, that's my, maybe a plant you might want to skip over. Obviously, we know about girdling roots. I think everyone understands girdling roots at this point. Um, you know, if a, if a tree or plant in general stays in a pot for too long, certainly those roots really have no escape but to continue encircling themselves. And I would also encourage you, for most species, be aware of codominant stems. And what I mean by that are simply twin trunks. So, in general, we like one nice central leader with good scaffold branches off the side of that. Now, here again, no matter the type of stock, stock you select, it's important that we travel carefully with them because even the best grower can produce the best product, but if we damage that tree when we're traveling with it, it really is kind of defeating the purpose of our caution um, in the beginning stages. So you know, protect those trees from the wind. Keep in mind, you know, these trees that have just been transplanted, they've lost a tremendous amount of root growth. As a result of that, of course, they are drying out, they're desiccating. So when we add high wind volumes, those leaves, of course, are gonna become more brittle until we can really establish a really good new active root growth. In addition to this, with bald and burlap, we certainly don't want to lift by the main trunk that dislodges the soil from the roots. Instead, lift with that root ball. And as you know, you don't have to plant the tree the same day you get it. It's not that critical that it go in the ground that day, but it is important that that tree remain watered and free of any major trunk injuries.
Now, when you're ready to install a tree into the ground, I would argue that there's two ways to do it. You can dig a hole and you can put a tree in it, or you can professionally plant a tree. I'm guilty of both. I, I've done both. I've dug a hole when I was in a hurry and just threw a tree in it. The tree will survive, but it won't survive long term or it has less chance to survive long term. Um, if you professionally plant a tree, by which I mean planting the tree into a large area and taking into consideration everything in the previous slides I've discussed already, then you have a much better setup. Digging a hole, putting a tree in, it's very straightforward. If this were the root ball and this were the hole, you know, we see this a lot in sometimes in the commercial landscape industry. Auger bits are used that are just barely the size of the root ball. They'll dig an auger hole and drop a tree into it and then walk away. Now, if you professionally plant a tree, you're going to know that that tree needs to go into a really well established planting area and not just a planting hole. In essence, what I want to get across with this slide is what one of our extension forestry specialists says, I'd much rather see you put a $100 tree in a $200 hole than to put a $200 tree in a $100 hole. Now, from this point forward, I'm going to kind of step away from that word planting hole. I don't love the word hole when we're talking about planting a tree. I would instead argue that you need to put that tree into an established area, so a large area. And what does that area look like? Well, it's much wider, right? It's not deep, it's just wide. The recommendation in most textbooks will tell you two to three times wider than the root ball. So a 20 inch root ball times three, that's 60 inches, that's a five foot diameter circle. I'm gonna argue you go ahead and take that to five times, three to five times of that. Now that may be as big as a, you know, 100 inches. What would that, 20, yeah, 20 times five, that'd be 100 inches wide. So we're talking almost an eight foot diameter hole, or excuse me, a planting area uh, to put that tree into. Now, we often hear roughing the sides of the planting hole um, but with a planting area, that's less of a problem because we're not really going to glaze that side as readily um, if we're actually kind of, you know, if we're, if we're focusing on a much larger area, there's not going to be that abrupt wall that we have to deal with. Now, I do want to use a little bit of caution with regards to soil amendments. Um, soil amendments can be beneficial if they're needed. Uh, but the one issue that we see with them is that they actually can have different water holding capacities. And that's really a problem if you're just putting it in a simple hole. If you're just adding some peat moss or some sand into that planting hole, then what winds up happening is that water is going to either drain or be retained at a different rate than what the natural native soils would. So use caution when we're talking in terms of soil amendments. In general, a good recommendation is no more than 20% of your planting area should be organic matter. And if you are gonna do that, be sure to incorporate those amendments well. That way you get this uniform soil texture. If we just amend a little bit right outside of the root ball, those roots are likely just gonna to wanna to stay in that nice newly amended soil. Now, gently slope the sides of the planting area. That can be important, of course, because we know that a lot of the, the roots of a tree actually exist in the upper 12 inches of the soil profile. They just don't go down as deep as we thought that they used to. Certainly, right off of the main crown of the tree, the root crown, you can see some that are three to four, maybe five foot deep but the majority of the working roots, the absorbing roots, are out here just below the earth's surface there, right above grade level. Now, plant properly. You know, this is a challenge. Um, I, I'm excited to get back in communication with everyone and actually have field days where we can do this in person because to plant properly is something you almost have to see. It's not easy to talk about over Zoom. Uh, but ultimately it does depend on that root flare. So again, the root flare being where that trunk starts to flare out and meet the ground 
just above where our roots are going to be. Um, so that's kind of what is important is that that flare remain visible throughout the planting process. And when we put a tree in at an incorrect depth, ultimately that leads to our root and our crown diseases and ultimately instability. Now, remove tags, wires, ropes, and the burlap sack. You know, we thought years ago that yes, tree roots will eventually leave that burlap sack, and they certainly will, but why would you not want to go ahead and give your tree the best opportunity for every one of those roots to find a way to venture out without having to grow through a burlap sack? When we keep them in the sack, we're encouraging that same root girdling uh, situation that we see in containers. And another thing that I think is important is that we orient the terminal bud, meaning the very top, the tip bud of that plant or the tree, facing the primary wind direction. And the reason I say that is because when we think in terms of you know what wind does to a tree, if we start off with a tree that's already got a slight lean to it, if that wind primarily is coming from you know one side, we're going to eventually push that tree over. And as that tree increases in weight, we're going to see that lean expedited. So I would encourage you instead to put that lean towards the wind direction. So over time, that helps to make that tree establish that nice central leader. So it has to fight against the wind rather than being continually pushed over by the wind. And keep in mind, too shallow is always going to be better than too deep. Um, I can fix a tree that's gone in the ground too shallow. You know, I can come in with a very fine layer of nice topsoil, maybe a nice high quality compost and a mulch, and I can fix that issue. But once you plant that tree too deep, there's little that can be done at that stage. And also, most of our stress and physiological disorders are usually traced back to poor planting practices, unfortunately. This is a great example. You know, we see this all the time in the landscape. Soil brought up too high along the main trunks, and this is very common, or soils that ultimately, roots that weren't teased apart and allowed to grow out radially. So with bald and burlap trees, of course, there are some advantages, right? They're larger in size, um, and they generally have these large root balls. Um, one thing I do want to keep in mind, a good note to remember is if you measure a tree at six inches, you want that root ball to be 10 to times 12, 10 to 12 times the diameter of that trunk. So a two inch caliper tree would need a minimum of a 20 inch diameter root ball. Now the downside is a lot of these bald and burlap trees have just been dug and you can see up to 95% of those absorbing roots lost. In other words, that tree is undergoing transplant shock. In addition, they're harder to move. We often see trunk injuries as a result of that. And some of our unique species can be hard to come by. So as I've talked before, you know, this would be what my planting area may look like for a bald and burlap tree, with my bald and burlap tree being the highlight species. Maybe this is our large oak with a nice dogwood beside it and some unique species out front. So if we have well-drained soils, you can go ahead and set that root ball right on the hard packed clay. But if it is a poorly drained soil, it's important that we raise that up by an inch or two to allow some drainage. Now, container grown trees, of course, have advantages as well, right? They don't have to undergo transplant shock. A lot of times they've spent their whole life in a container and as a result, no roots are gonna be severed. They're easy to move. You can put them in a car or a truck. Oftentimes we see more symmetrical plants, particularly our shrubs. And also you can plant a container grown plant most any time of year because they have numerous roots to take over and initiate that growth. The downsize is they may be a little smaller. Girdling roots are certainly possible. And as I mentioned previously, we do see sometimes where they get planted too deep at the nursery. Now, bare root trees. So these are gonna be little guys. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever planted a bare root tree, but they can actually lead to some pretty impressive growth. 
Uh, they're very easy to plant. I still encourage you to establish a large planting area. Now, the reason that is, is because as those roots begin to grow, they're gonna be really encouraged to go out into this nice newly tilled soil. The downside is they're gonna be smaller in size. So it's both an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, you know, one other important factor is bare root trees really only have maybe seven to 10 roots on them. So it is important that they stay moist. And you can do that by wrapping them in just, you know, tissue paper or newspaper as well. They don't do well in the heat of the sun, so you certainly don't want them out in full sun. And it can be kind of hard to determine where that root flare is, but it is important to pay attention to that when we're putting them in the ground. So which is best? You know, I realize this is a busy slide, but I just want to quickly look at this. If you look at the size of the pleat, these are both spruce trees that were transplanted. This one was transplanted at a smaller size than the one on the right. So this is the size of the tree at planting. So this one transplanted as a smaller tree. And what we see after putting that tree in the ground are really these dominant, really nice, heavy duty growth rings. This tree is really putting active growth on. But in the larger transplanted tree, what we see is really this major stunting in years one, two, and three as a result of transplant shock. So by the time this tree actually catches up and resumes the growth that we would see in this neighboring smaller transplanted spruce, the smaller tree has already surpassed the size of the larger tree that we not only paid more money for, but we also have, you know, we have uh, purchased this, we've had a harder time installing this, and the tree suffered as a result of this. So it depends. Certainly a large bald and burlap tree can quickly add a beautiful area to your yard. So I'm not saying don't do it, but uh, I, it just depends on your, your situation and timing. Now, after we plant, of course, it's important to remember that transplanting is a really major operation for a living organism. And trees are really slow to recover from this. We don't recommend pruning, we don't recommend fertilizing, and don't put black plastic down. Uh, geotextile fabrics that allow for water and, and gas circulation are acceptable, but black plastic is kind of no longer recommended at this stage. Now water after transplant is the key to survival, right? We often hear if we get, you know, less than an inch of water a week, water your tree. But really there's no right answer as to how much water to give. Um, I like to do long, slow, saturating soaks every five to seven days. You know, a little bit of drought is not bad for a tree. It, it actually encourages it to seek new water sources. And keep in mind, excessive water accumulation in that planting hole oftentimes leads to death, just like we saw in the case study earlier. So ultimately, how do you test? Well, you dig down about three to five inches and simply look at the soil. Get a soil probe and stick it in there. If it's dry at five inches, you probably do need to water. Now, what does watering properly look like? You know, this is something that we, we just talked about. You know, I see this all the time. People say, oh, I'm gonna go water my tree and they'll drop a hose right at the base of the hole and they'll flood that hole. And that is ultimately what leads to early tree death. That saturates that entire hole and it becomes a soup boil that, the soup bowl that inhibits gas exchange. So that is not an ideal situation. Also, I realize this is a large tree, but you wanna use caution with your sprinkler system. Make sure they're not spraying directly on those newly tender planted trees. So what do I like to use? Well, I like these fountain style sprinklers. Uh, they actually allow for about, you know, eight feet worth of water penetration on one side and eight feet on the other. So we almost have, you know, a 16 to 20 foot diameter water circle and this is usually low um, you know low output so it's not compacting the soil and it ultimately can be left on for a long time to deeply penetrate that soil so what does that look like well in 3d you know i'm going to encourage you to water way out here at the drip line even beyond the drip line 
with that third one not really watering that root ball, but instead if this were a topical view, really in three locations. So I might encourage you to start with 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and that gives you a good hour. Now staking is rarely needed. Um, you know, all too often we see staking that just restricts tree movement and that is never going to be a good thing. The tree then becomes dependent on that stake and all too often these devices get left behind. Uh, we see it all the time in the urban landscape. So just remember the stronger the breeze, the stronger the trees. So, you know, in certain instances staking may be warranted, but if you plant that tree correctly, it should not need staking unless it's a very tall, mature plant, uh, you know, from the get-go, so. Hey Lee, we have a question. Yes, sir, Craig. Uh, J.D. Burnett says, uh, do you have any favorite polycultures or support species that you like to plant together with overstory trees like oak, magnolia, tulip poplar, et cetera? Yes. That this is gonna be recorded and shared and it will be. It, it will be, and that's, that's a great question because you bring up a really good point. Um, you know, with regards to species offhand, I don't have any that I would say, you know, complement one another, but what is important is making sure that those complementary species have the same cultural requirements as your primary tree. So in other words, you wouldn't want a drought tolerant species and then a very wet tolerant species together. Um, because we would have to manage those differently with when it comes to, you know, uh, actual sprinkler systems. So, so picking species that are, you know, that have like, uh, like cultural requirements would be important. And I bring up dogwood just because we think in terms of dogwoods, I see them in front yards all the time, but keep in mind dogwoods are understory species. They really thrive in that, that shaded environment. So, um, certainly you can reach out to me as well and I can help, you know, establish a plan if need be. Now pruning at the time of planting, we, we don't do that anymore. Years ago it was thought we'll cut back the top as much as you cut back the bottom, the roots. But ultimately all we're doing by that is removing plant tissues that ultimately produce those growth hormones. And we don't want to do that. In turn that encourages this leggy growth and suckering throughout the canopy. It can also delay bud break later in the spring. Now, there are exceptions. If you have dead limbs in your new planted tree, remove the dead limbs. If you have broken branches, remove those broken branches. And same is true for crossing limbs that rub against one another. Now, also, this is not fruit tree talk, but fruit trees, we prune those very aggressively at the time of planting. So are you saying don't prune the tree at all? Absolutely not. I'm saying prune the tree. Structure pruning is one of the best things we can do for a tree, but it's important that we wait until that tree has established a really well-developed root system first. So two to three years down the line, we can set a tree off on the right foot. When we think in terms of the goal we're looking for, so if you see this yellow highlighter here, um, I want to promote a strong central leader, so a nice tree, and then I want to get rid of this co-dominant stem so that I have one nice central leader going up that tree. I also want to look for well-spaced scaffold branches, so I see some crowding here. Now if I were to take a cross-sectional cut here and look down on that, maybe this is what we see before structure pruning. We've got duplicates here, we've got crossing branches here. So by doing a few simple cuts, we can take these same six branches and turn them down to three that are really spaced radially very well and lead to long-term growth. Now, should you mulch your tree? Well, I'm gonna ask if you're an A-type mulcher or a B-type mulcher. If you're an A-type mulcher, I'm gonna say, no, leave the mulch alone, don't touch it. If you're a B-type mulcher, I'm gonna say, absolutely. There's nothing more critical, important than putting a nice layer of mulch down after planting a tree. You know, the benefits are, are just numerous. Uh, encourages this really wonderful biotic system that's full of bacteria, fungi, and vertebrates. And ultimately, they are helping to degrade that soil and thus providing nutrients to that tree. Uh, obviously, they conserve soil moisture. It reduces the competition with grass. 
low soil temperatures are provided. And it ultimately, over time, as that material degrades and filter feeds down into our native clay, it ultimately builds up that soil structure. But more importantly, mulch just keeps people off the tree's root zones. Um, you know, if you were at a park, you probably wouldn't drive your truck over here and park underneath this tree. But if it were grass, you probably would. Um, same is true for mowers. You know, we don't need a commercial mower running over this root zone every seven days all the way through summer and into the fall. So keeping that, uh, you know, keeping people away from the tree is great. It also reduces the chance, of course, of string trimmers nicking the bark. So proper mulch is really just three inches of any high quality organic compost and mulch you can find. Um, mulch ring should really be two to three times the width of the root ball, kind of the same as the planting hole, but I encourage you to go further. And for our established trees, really like this image shows, you wanna go about five feet beyond that drip line. Now I know people laugh at that when I say that and they say, well, I'm never putting that much mulch and you may not want to, but keep in mind, if we were to walk into a forest, this is what this tree would have, is a really nice 10 inch layer of duff material. Sticks, twigs, big leaves that are decomposing over time. Soil, uh, silt that is filtered in. So I try and mimic what I see in the forest. And proper planting ultimately just produces really long lived healthy trees. And it's not always easy to get them established, but it is always important. Because when we neglect those cultural requirements, ultimately we prune more frequently, we damage root systems, we have to pay more to maintain those plants, and we wind up with an undesired effect oftentimes. And that puts us in this vicious monetary cycle where we pay for a plant, we pay to install it, we pay to maintain it, we pay to remove it, and then oftentimes, I've even seen the exact same species go back in the same exact location. And why do I bring all this up? This is my last, I think, two slides. You know, I bring this up because trees are either doing one of two things. They're either living or they're dying. Um, and microscopic foes are there to capitalize on that. You know, our plant pest and our pathogens, they're made to survive. They're these R selected species that have an abundant number of offspring that are relatively short lived. But we also have those plant pathogens, ceridium canker, inanatus, hypoxylon, ganoderma, crits, tremetes, leucocoprinus, tafrina, dogwood anthracnose, maple spot. Tremendous amount of pathogens are out there and these are all microscopic spores floating around waiting for an opportunity to start doing their job. So ultimately we expedite their survival in urban landscapes. So I want you to focus on some of these proper techniques to keep that plant as healthy as possible. We expedite the survival of these because we use the same 10 species in every urban environment we have oftentimes. We also sell species that are susceptible to these problematic pathogens. We love to landscape in monocultures and we ultimately just ignore the requirements of that plant, which ultimately leads to stress. So with that, I'll conclude with some really nice images of trees that I hope I uh, encourage you to go out and plant a new species out on your location that complements your environment, that has room to grow, and that really brings in an amount of splendor to you each and every day, but also benefits the urban forest as a whole. Thanks, Lee. That was great. Um, I've got a couple of uh, questions for you that have came up, and uh, I'm going to read through some of those. Uh, several folks have said great job. Uh, let's see, the first one I'm going to go to. Um, which trees are to be planted to reduce pollution in cities? Um, well, I would say any tree. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of trees that actually, you know, help to do that. Of course, you know, they, they help capture particulates in the air. 
those, of course, then are, you know, circulated down to the soil surface as well. So I, I'm okay with any tree that goes in the ground in the urban area. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is if you are in an area where you know there's a lot of pollution or could be salt, and salt is one pollutant that trees can't handle very well because it does dry out those roots, um, use caution with that. Um, certain species are more prone to air pollutants to have problems as a result of those air pollutants than others. And I have a great resource that I can actually provide um, that talks to that a little bit as well. Great. Now, uh, the next question, uh, suggestions on how to break up hard pan in compacted soils that results from construction equipment. Yeah, great question. So it kind of depends on a couple of things. Number one, what tools do you have at your disposal? Um, certainly getting a blade and a bulldozer can help, you know, cut through three, three feet worth of hard pan very easily. Probably can't get a bulldozer in your backyard though. Um, one thing I might encourage, and I have in the past seen success with this, is you can go to our local garden centers and they make core bits that are either two inches or three inches. Um, and you can attach those to a high power drill and you can certainly drill down, you know, 18 to 24 inches with those. They're very long auger bits. Um, they're not but 20 or $30 and they can be really beneficial. And once you're done with that, you'll want to backfill those holes with a really nice loamy soil and kind of get that incorporated over time. Uh, if you don't really want to go that aggressive, you can certainly come in with a smaller tool such as a pitchfork, like a five-tine pitchfork that has tines that are 12 to 18 inches long. And you can stick thousands of holes in the ground with that, break apart that clay and ultimately get some air and then again back with the organic content. I got one more question here. Um, the uh, Ursula is asking, I want to plant several uh, apple trees soon. Can I plant them on the south facing slope or should it be north facing since it's a warmer climate here in Knoxville or this East Tennessee? Well, that's a good question. So, um, you know, oftentimes when people ask about whether or not they can plant a tree here in Knoxville, I usually try and steer them towards blueberries instead. We have a lot of issues with, with our apple trees. I'm not going to say that you can't get by with them here, but we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of heat and humidity that brings a lot of major pests and pathogens in on apple trees. Um, I would encourage probably a south facing slope over a north, but the problem is the elevation here. You know, we, we really are a really low elevation, so we see a lot of buildup of pathogens here on apple trees. So um, I may need to research that a little more to make sure I'm telling you correctly, but I feel like south facing is what I would suggest offhand. Good. I don't have any others, but I do have a question for you, Lee. Okay. Um, when you were mentioning your percolation test, uh, you mentioned that fill up the hole, walk away for 24 hours, and then come back and then start your measurements. What's the, uh, what's the reasoning for filling up the hole right off the bat, walking away, and then coming back later and doing it? I'm sorry. I must not have said to refill it a second time, Casey. Did no, yeah, you did, you did say refill it a second time. I'm just oh, wondering okay. why, not do, why not do the measurements on uh, day one? On the first hole. Okay, because we want to get that soil to field capacity first. So, you know, that means after all the gravitational water has left the system and the water is at, or the soil is at field capacity. So no more water can be in that soil at that stage. That is, of course, is going to restrict, or, you know, that's going to be what we generally see as a result of, you know, after that water's flowed through, then we can fill that up and we know what we're going to look at with regards to a soil that's at field capacity. So at field capacity, what rate are we going to see? If it's a dry soil, of course, it's going to flow through a little quicker than if we were at field capacity. If that makes sense. I hope I didn't get all wonky on you there, Casey. No, no, that was good. I think that was, uh, that's good information to know. So, I think it's oftentimes misconstrued to 
dig the hole and start your percolation test. Right, right. So water, of course, flows, you know, laterally as well as, of course, up and down. So I want to make sure that soil is fully saturated. And then I want to watch what that water does after that, not when it's a dry soil. That's right. Um, we also had several folks who asked about this being posted. Uh, Lee, I think you're going to share that with Trees Knoxville to get on the uh, Trees Knoxville YouTube site. So those folks who uh, aren't familiar with Trees Knoxville, it's treesknoxville.org. And uh, Lee, are you gonna be posting this on anything of yours as well from UT Extension? Yes, thank you, Casey, for mentioning that. I will provide this, of course, to Tracy with Trees Mo Knoxville. Looking forward to helping there. And uh, for those of you that don't know or already follow me, I have started a video series, Talking Trees with Lee. You can Google that on Facebook or YouTube, and you should get a link to our UT Extension page. And basically throughout the summer, I've produced about 15 or 16 different videos where I'm talking about timely subjects that I see here in Knox County. I will be posting this to, um, to the, my YouTube page as well as the Knox County Facebook page, yes. Great. If there's not any other questions, um, I think we can adjourn. Uh, last call, if anybody has any other questions, I will wait uh, uh, 15, 20 seconds here. Type it in there real quick. Um, if not, I want to thank Lee. Lee, that was a great presentation, and I always enjoy hearing you talk. And uh, it's great to have you in Knox County and another great resource here as well. So, um, I don't see anything coming up. I hear a lot of thank yous and great jobs. And uh, with that, I appreciate everybody coming in for attendance tonight. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. You see, I just, I just want to add uh, the thanks from the tree board. Of course, Lee's a member of the tree board, but um, the, as uh, education chair, uh, uh, I would really like to thank him for what he's done tonight. I learned a heck of a lot. It's really, really been informative and I really appreciate it. And uh, also just to put in a plug for, we're trying to make this a regular series, third, third Monday of the month series. We're probably gonna do something with tree planting, actually planting a tree next month for an Arbor Day type thing. But, so I don't know how we're gonna manage that with the social distancing requirements, but we will be publicizing that as well. And then I would assume we might take December off and start again in the new year, uh, but we're trying to, the tree board is trying to put these things together uh, to just keep ourselves out there in the public uh, during, uh, you know, this pandemic. So thanks again, Lee, and uh, thanks yes, also sir. to everybody who showed up. We really appreciate y'all coming yeah. out. Thank you, Craig, and also everybody that was here as an attendee, thank you for taking time out of your evening to watch this. This is really great. and. We'll certainly be back in person here soon and looking forward to that one day. So um, absolutely. If you need to contact me, uh, I can be reached on UT uh, extension page for Knox County. Just go to the staff link and you can easily see me there. So I'll be happy to answer any other questions, but uh, I think we're all very fortunate to live in a progressive city like Knoxville that does have a very strong urban forestry program. So thanks to the Knoxville Tree Board, Casey and Craig, Trees Knoxville as well. So, All right. Thank you all. And all right. uh, everyone have a good evening. Good night. See ya. Bye.